All right. Hey, everybody. Um, this is a real treat for me, and thank you, Jeff. Um, he called me months back asking if I would do this talk, and I was just thrilled. Um, full transparency, we don't have a batting product. Uh, so I'm not up here to talk to you guys about something we sell. Um, I'm going to give you some insights into things we've learned through our biomechanics lab over the years. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. But um, yeah, so a little bit about my background. I was a biomedical engineer at uh, MSOE, School of Milwaukee. Played collegiate baseball, was a uh, very <laughs> mediocre pitcher, a really bad batter. Um, you know, I always struggled with coaches telling me things to do mechanically, or really just showing me something, and they could never explain it mechanically, and I faltered. Uh, pitching, on the pitching side of things, you know, I was plagued with injuries as well, and always asked myself why, and uh, you know, thought it was mechanics. So I started working with the Milwaukee Brewers as a motion capture technician in their biomechanics lab. I uh, did that for a couple of years, from 2010 to 2012. And at that point, I thought, really, pitchers get hurt because of their mechanics. And um, anyways, fast forward to what I do now. Uh, I joined Modus as the first employee in 2012, so for the last better part of eight years. Um, our goal was to bring motion capture to the masses. And so we started by opening a lab down at IMG Academy. Um, oh, i got to plug this in. Uh, so we had a, a motion capture lab down at IMG Academy. And um, the two founders, Joe and Keith, tasked me with building a database of human movement. And someday, somehow, we're going to go ahead and take that database and make a product with it. But um, yeah, so for several years, we just built databases of motion capture, um, all kinds of sports. Um, have a little bit of background about our lab. So we, we have 16 Raptor E Mac cameras. So those are Motion Analysis Corporation. They can be used indoor and outdoor. Uh, samples at 480 hertz. And we also have Vertec force plates in our the brick and mortar lab, and that's flush with some play performance flooring. We did a study for them, and they they donated it to us. That was awesome. Um, we do all the marker tracking with the motion analysis software, but we do all the physics internally. So that's kind of the, the second bit of what I was tasked with is build a physics engine for all these different movements. Um, but yeah, we've tested a lot of a lot of athletes, uh, over 2,400 subjects in total. Uh, you can see how it's split up there. We've got 241 golfers, uh, 35 of those are professional, 332 batters, uh, 142 were pro batters, 662 pitchers with 375 uh, being professional. Now a lot of that was done in conjunction with a study with ASMI, so we would shoot all their data. We traveled on site to different teams, we'd set up in their bullpens, test pitchers. Um, we also did services for teams, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and then we do a lot of other testing with other miscellaneous sports. Uh, you, normally, when I would do a presentation like this, I would spend 15, 20 minutes talking about motion capture, but I don't think in this day and age we need to do that, thanks to um, a lot of the driveline guys uh, who have really popularized this. Um, so, but yeah, a little quick, so we take uh, markers, uh, we put them on the body, we have like 56 or so, we'll put on a batter model, um, and then uh, we'll track those in 3D position with the cameras, um, can have anywhere from 8 to 16 going at once. We usually have the labs split up, one in New York, one in Florida. Now all of them are in my garage, just collecting dust. But uh, once in a while, we'll take it out to collect some more data. But yeah, so the talk of today is, well, really, it's going to be around the kinetic chain. And this means a lot to a lot of people. Um, the base concept is you know, building energy from the ground up. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to actually measure that, what are good, what are bad. Um, but this is just an example from a tennis report, you know, looking at hip speed, trunk speed, rotational speeds, and then you know, racket speeds. Uh, pretty standard. You guys have all seen this curve before. But I want to tell you a quick story first. Um, so I got the chance to meet Nick Boletieri. I don't know if you guys know this guy. Um, but he's a tennis guru. And um, you know, he had his own training academy that was then bought by IMG. So down in Bradenton, uh, you know, he's kind of the, the centerpiece figure still. But, uh, so the story is, we went to go test tennis for the first time, and I was so excited. I was like, I get to meet Nick Boletieri. I'm, like, I'm just going to lay down some awesome biomechanics content. He's going to love it. And uh, first thing he says, I didn't even get a word in, he goes, the kinetic chain is bullshit. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my god, this is going to be awful. And um, I mean, that pretty much sums up our entire relationship at IMG. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so what, my goal today for you guys is to take the Nick Boletieri look today, the mindset. All the slides I share, I want you to look at it through his lens and just see, really ask yourself, is what we're measuring really useful? And uh, yeah, hopefully through the end of it, we'll, we'll come out with some good inf information. 
Uh, another thing, at the end of this, I have some t-shirts uh, that I'm gonna hand out. It's gonna be a five question quiz or four questions, so just take some notes and uh, maybe you'll get lucky. But. All right, so first, um, you know, I think we'll all, we all can recognize that golf is what pioneered biomechanics and concepts of the kinetic chain. So we're gonna start with some golf biomechanics and move from there. So here is uh, one of the probably most common concepts of the kinetic chain is getting separation in certain parts of the body. This one is a uh, trunk separation during the swing. So what we're looking at is the green line is the pelvis, um, pelvis uh, rotational plane axes. We have one on the, the trunk in blue. What, one measure that we'll, we'll golfers look at is trunk separation at peak backswing. This golfer gets about 59 degrees of separation. And then another term you've seen uh, is the x-factor stretch, which is the amount of rotation they get after peak backswing and then into that initial part of the rotation. So, so right as the hips start to activate and start to rotate, there's a little bit more stretch. This golfer in particular gets, I can't read this, at six, uh, six degrees of x-factor stretch. So pretty common thing in golf to measure. Does it matter? Uh, yes, I think, uh, well, kind of, yes and no. In our database, it correlates within subject to club head speed, but um, one of a kind of a, just a landmark study was by Dr. Joe Myers, who was with the Rays, uh, did a lot of golf testing, and um, yeah, they found that trunk separation was a really good uh, indicator of club head speed. So I think it's, a, I think it's safe to say that trunk separation in golf is, is good on an individual basis, and I think some of these studies have also supported that. All right, the next bit of the kinetic chain is looking at rotational velocities. Um, so first, let's start with a linear velocity. That would be a change in position over time, so like miles per hour. Uh, rotational velocity would be a change in angle over time. So that's gonna be um, what we're gonna look at in some of the next slides. So with something like trunk rotation, obviously the, the theta there. So th at stance, this batter is minus 25 degrees of trunk rotation globally, and then at contact, he's at in this case, 80, just an example. I don't even know if that's real data. So that's 105 degrees of trunk rotation, maybe over, you know, what, 200, mil, 200 milliseconds? That's what, like 400 degrees per second? I mean, just roughly, you know, it's not how we measure things. But um, so that's what we're gonna talk about in this kinematic sequence slide. So for golfers, um, you know, they, they, they start at the address, they get to reach peak backswing. Um, some people look at the order of that sequence but uh, everything I'm gonna focus on today is gonna be between basically peak backswing and contact, or you know, foot contact and ball release, or you know, stride and ball contact. And you can see um, this, this golfer's out of sequence, something that you know, we all are kind of getting familiar with. So his trunk peaks in rotational velocities first, and then his hips do. But um, yeah, so another way to kind of look at this, we, we visualize it with the little, uh, oh, this might have a, a pointer on it, I'm not sure. but. Uh, yeah, you can't really see it. Maybe you can, but we'll indicate ranges. So usually the, the hips fire right after peak um, backswing, and then some time frame later, the, the trunk will accelerate. These are actually looking at rotational accelerations in this upper plot, but we'll talk about that in a bit too. But that's the basis of the kinetic chain, transferring energy through rotational velocities. Um, uh, Myers found that, yeah, upper trunk rotation velocities was a good indicator of club speed. Uh, we kind of did too, you know, across uh, subjects, even within subjects, there's a, a bit of a correlation there. So I think it's a good indicator of, you know, something to train for in golf. All right, now we'll talk about some pitching biomechanics. So again, this is something we'll do. We'll set, set the cameras up on a mound. Um, we'll just capture them in their most natural environment. Um, golf is done in more in a lab. We'll talk about hitting, how we do that against live BP as well. But uh, so here's um, that same golfer versus Lance McCullers. So uh, also, we have the, the elite database, uh, or just the normative database in the background in that little shaded region. But I want you to just kind of pay attention and see how similar these motions may be. So right as the pitcher gets into foot plant, uh, you can see there's a rapid increase in trunk separation. So let's look at that again. I was kind of scrubbed through. So the, the golfer, you can see, reaches a lot of separation before any kind of movement's going on. He's just, he gets to that point. Um, Lance McCullers, you can see he's kind of just hanging out, not too much separation. As soon as that foot plants, uh, there's basically a full stoppage uh, of that pelvis moving forward, and it really just pivots around that lead leg. But they both get about the same amount of trunk separation. Uh, 58 degrees for Lance, 59 for the golfer. So uh, yeah, there's a ton of separation that goes on in pitchers. I and mean, we see 
pictures frequently with more than 90 degrees of separation or up to 90 degrees of separation. It's, it's a very similar trait to the golf swing. All right, this one, again, so I do apologize. We're going to talk about a lot of like just intricate math things and ways to look at data. And one thing I have a real stick about is when I look at these kinematic sequence graphs, they're all global rotation velocities. I'm going to show you what I mean, um, which is a better way to do it, which is with local rotation velocities. So with pitchers, uh, if, you know, if I'm moving my pelvis, my trunk is speeding at the same speed. You know, now if I add velocity, it's going to be faster. And so almost every kinematic sequence, the trunk is always going to be faster than the pelvis if you look at global rotation velocities. Um, but if you subtract them out, so if you separate them, say, all right, uh, I want to look at the relative rotation speed of my trunk on top of my pelvis, something really interesting happens here. So um, if I do global, there's about 60 milliseconds of, of time between when the hips fire and the trunk fires. And that's just, again, on the population of these pitchers. Um, but if I separate them out, there's actually 15 milliseconds of separation. So if you're really trying to understand when things are sequencing, you really ought to look at the local rotation speeds. Um, and I'll show you another, some visuals there too. But one side note, so for all these wireless products out there that have multi-sensors um, you know, for kinematic sequencing, a, a connection interval in iOS is 30 milliseconds. So that means you can send information, a coded like, hey, that was a swing, tell the other sensors that a swing happened. That's 30 milliseconds. If you miss one connection interval, I mean, you would, you'd, have, you'd be shifted a little bit. So just keep that in mind. Um, it often happens that iOS frequently will drop packets. Um, and so it's really important to have you know, your data be in sync when you have multiple sensors. You know, one really good product that actually never made to market was Swing IQ with Intel. They had actually a wired uh, three sensor network. We did a lot of validation work for them. Um, but there are other issues. The shirt was just floppy, so it didn't really give good data. But yeah, something to keep in mind. So this is what you know, global versus local velocities will look like. So here you can see on the left is just a you know, side fixed image. Uh, and then on the right is with a camera fixed to the pelvis. So uh, as the picture gets into foot plant, you'll see a large amount of separation occurs. And we'll back it up a little bit. So here as foot plant gets ready to happen, you can see there's not much separation. The hips start to peak in rotation velocity. And there on the right, you can see there's a you know, peak separation almost. But um, yeah, so uh, next thing that happens, you'll see on the left, the peak trunk speed occurs right there. But on the right, it occurs approximately 15 milliseconds later. So again, I'm, when we're separating them out, I'm looking at just the trunk rotating over the pelvis. And I think that's a much better indicator of a kinematic sequence in pitching. Uh, also, I mean, you can see the ro ro relative rotation speed is also increasing. So um, just note that in pitching for now. Uh, it doesn't matter. So I can't even read these here either. But um, kind of, you know, so trunk, people that rotate faster generally throw harder uh, with their hips or their trunk. Um, but a really important thing here in pitching is the, the timing separation. So that time millisecond gap, the shorter it is, I'm sorry, the longer it is, the faster pitchers throw. So he's at negative time. But so that's, that's really interesting too. So another coachable thing is to create more uh, uh, time between when your hips fire and your trunk fires. That's a good thing in baseball to coach, in baseball pitching. All right, now we're going to get into batting mechanics and really just kind of compare all three. We're going to start with Carlos Correa's trunk separation. Um, so this is, again, just looking at motion capture data. We'll look at video first. But yeah, as he goes into load, you can see not really separated. And then he's going to go into foot plant, and there'll be some separation. And maybe not. And then ball contact. So this is something that was really glad to hear you know, Mike yesterday talk about. Um, you know, PCR, and he kind of pre pre precluded this, that batters don't separate. And I really don't think, this is the one that can be a big premise of the next slides, is batters do not separate their pelvis and their trunk. You should not be coaching them to do that. The elite hitters do not. Um, so let's look at Carlos Correa trunk separation here again. So he's in the stance. He's actually closed. He's got a little negative um, separation. And he's going to go into foot plant. He'll get about a little less than 20 degrees of separation in the swing. The average professional batter sits between 20 and about 35 degrees of se peak separation. Remember golfers and, and, and pitchers? They're frequently above 60, some above 90. Batters just do, elite batters just do not separate their, their core. Now let's look at all three together. All right, so just like a slide play.
All right, so next thing um, is looking at the, the rotation velocities in hitters. Um, we'll start with Andrew McCutcheon, one of the fastest hip speeds we've recorded in a, in a professional batter. Uh, we'll look at his kinematic sequence here. So on the left are the global rotation velocities. On the right are the, the relative. So you can see on the left, he does have a, you know, a good sequence. Uh, his hips fire, then his trunk builds in velocity. Um, but yeah, really good hip speed. He also has pretty good bat speed, about 88 miles an hour bat speed. But look at the rel relative rotation velocities. This is really interesting. So on the right side, you can see his, hip, his hips uh, reach a peak. And then after ball contact, his trunk reaches a peak. There's really nothing the trunk is doing. He's not adding any velocity before the ball's contact's made. So again, coaching sequencing in a swing, I just don't get it. Um, but yeah, so that's what Andrew McCutcheon does. And, uh, compared to the elite database in the background. All right, so uh, let's look at another concept here of using hip speed to project a batter. So here's Andrew McCutcheon on the left, 850 degrees per second. Here's an anonymous batter's core rotating faster at 950 degrees per second. So now, many of you may think, let's get this guy signed up. Let's, uh, let's take a, a better look. Is this the next prospect? Is this the next MVP? Um, unfortunately, that was a 12-year-old batter. So. Uh, this is another common thing that I really would urge people to do is don't look at rotation velocities. They're only um, you know, relevant in certain populations, but uh, in this case, the little kids have no inertia, like the mass and the, 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 the inertial uh, matrix of their torso and their hips is so much smaller, they can spin it really fast. Think about going on a merry-go-round. You know, if you go on a merry-go-round, you sit on the outside of it, and you're holding on, you go around, it's, you go pretty slow, but then when you lean in, you bring that inertia, that, that um, that radius of gyration gets closer to the center and it spins up faster. So really shouldn't be using hip speed to bend batters into, into talent pools. In fact, we did a study, so we published that youth batters actually have greater hip speed than professional batters. Uh, trunk rotation velocities are about the same in every age population. Again, this is back to that slide we showed with McCutcheon on you know, global versus uh, you know, local rotation velocities. But you can see in a standard kinematic sequence graph, you may think, oh, he's, that's a good sequence. The hips go and then the trunk goes. Uh, it adds you know, energy. That's, that's kinetic chain, right? But again, if we separate them out, you can see there's a very small peak right before ball contact. But the real peak in what the trunk you know, rotates relative to the pelvis occurs after ball contact. Um, so yeah, other things here we're looking at. You know, do these, do these hip speeds and timing matter in a swing? They really don't. They don't correlate to bat speed really at all. And um, yeah, I just wouldn't use them for that. Either does the time gap. So having more separation when your hips fire and then when your trunk fires, that time gap also doesn't correlate. All right, but that doesn't mean that kinetic chain is really dead in batting. I don't think it is. There's other ways to look at it, and that's kind of the goal here. So one way you can start to look at this is through rotational accelerations. So back to... Just the definitions, um, and a linear acceleration is your change in velocity over time, and an angular acceleration is change in that angular rate over time. So a little bit different way to look at it. And we've talked about this through other presentations, so it should be an interesting concept. But yeah, so a standard uh, kinematic sequence with uh, you know, rotation velocities in the solid line. You can see for batters it peaks. This is McCutcheon data, I believe. Um, and then a little bit later, you can see the, the solid blue line peaks. But what are the rotation accelerations? Those are the dotted lines. So in order for the, the hips to speak, it has to accelerate rotationally, and same for the trunk. So the next question is, can we use those to kind of understand the swing better? Um, you know, you, Jeff actually mentioned uh, an article that came across his desk, Dave Fortenbaugh. So Dave actually used to work with Modis. Um, he actually was one of the guys that got me into Modis. And we had talked about this at length. And one of the things we, we kind of settled on was, how does a batter feel the kinetic chain? You know, is it are you feeling speed? Probably not. You're probably going to feel force. So we, we chose to look at early on the swing in terms of these rotational accelerations um, because it just felt like something a batter could feel. Uh, so here's George Springer's kinetic chain with ex uh, angular accelerations. You can see he's pretty much off the chart in every category, um, mostly with his lead forearm. Um, back elbow was not. But uh, yeah, so things that we look at here, um, thigh, lead thigh and back thigh. Uh, those generally peak before the pelvis does in a, in, a, in a baseball swing. So the thighs globally will start to rotate a bit more. Um, you can see every other segment in here, and it gets pretty wonky to look at. But uh, in this case, um, 
yeah, the pelvis will accelerate first, the trunk will accelerate second, and maybe there's something in that you could look at for training batters. But um, actually, what I've spent a little more time on is rotational energies. So uh, the definition of kinetic energy is really just that inertia of that segment multiplied by the angular rate squared, one half times that. But uh, so these are just standard, you know, rotation velocities weighted by subject mass. That's really all it is. So you can take your KVS data, you can take 4D, you can take, you know, whatever diamond kinetics is working on, take that data and just multiply it by some mass property, and you're gonna get a much better indicator of uh, something that can be used for performance. Um, so again, it's just that angular rate data. So these are rotational energies versus bat speed, extremely potent in terms of predicting bat speed. So if you wanna increase bat speed, it's gonna be about ro increasing that rotational energy in a batter. So it's close, I think you could just make some transformations of your data you have and do something pretty nice with it. So this, yeah, we're gonna, do, we're gonna talk about pelvis rotation and then get into a, a, an interesting case study. Um, but one way to get more hip speed or hip energy is to get more pelvis rotation at contact. So we've seen that the batters who get their hips all the way through, close to 90 degrees, so zero would be in the stance, uh, 45 would be approaching ball contact, and then 90 would be having your hips square to the, the pitcher at ball contact. And generally we see a pretty good correlation uh, between and within subjects on hip, hip rotation and hip speed. Um, however, one thing we'll, we'll also wanna look at is, you know, a lot of times batters can't get their hips through, um, either it's a strength issue and they have poor hip speed or they have a mobility limitation. So we often will test um, our players with something called the M1. It's a, just a range of motion test where we do every joint and every degree of freedom it can move. Uh, you can see what the average um, internal rotation is for uh, some, some pictures here. But yeah, so this is a case study we did. This is a batter, Malik Collymore. He was in the Cardinals organization back in 2014. He's not now, he was released. Um, playing indie ball, but he's a really interesting case study to me. You know, he has pretty good bat speed, really good hand speed. Uh, his kinetic uh, chain in terms of accelerations were really good. Um, we can walk, this, there's some other things we'll measure. This will come up in a little bit too, but we'll look at things like foot placement during the stance. Um, we can look at, uh, we're looking at here, oh, toe touch and, and stride. So yeah, I think for him, his foot lands, uh, 180 milliseconds before ball contact, which was when uh, the ball has traveled 36 feet out of the pitcher's hand, a little bit later than most batters. Um, but what I really want to get to is the ball contact issue. So he has really good hip speed, but really poor rotation at contact. And we wanted to see, well, how could we get a little bit more out of him? And we looked and we saw that he actually had a lead hip uh, asymmetry. So his lead, his left hip had less internal rotation than his right hip. Um, often a very common thing we see in batters or any, any position player, pitchers, batters. There's usually a shift, not only in shoulders and pitchers, but hips and batters will have a shift. So again, I don't know what, what he ended up doing with this. Um, I don't know if he got more hip mobility, but I would say he probably has a bit more projectability if he could just improve, improve his lead hip rotation and uh, get a bit more hip speed, maybe bat speed. All right, now we're gonna transition into the back elbow. This is another area of the chain that's often ignored, but um, I think it's really potent. So we find that batters who make contact with a more extended elbow have better bat speed versus batters who make contact with their elbow more flexed and closer to their body, they have poorer bat speeds. Now some of this can be ball location dependent, but just as a general assumption, um, I wanna look into why that happens. So here's two different exit velocities. We have George Springer, he had 108 mile exit velocity. We don't always record exit velocity, these two cases we did. Then on the right is Austin Meadows, uh, see if I can replay that. Well, actually, we can just keep it at that frame. But this is the ball contact point. So you can see um, Springer is really extended at contact. Austin Meadows is much more collapsed. Um, again, just a case study. But that's what the, the principle I'm trying to illustrate here. All right, so why, why, why is that? So I'll, first, I want to talk about some muscle dynamics. And I think it could maybe lead to an interesting discussion. But uh, I'm sure everyone may have seen this in their, in their time. Uh, force velocity relationships of a muscle cell. This says that muscle cells that are contracting at high rates of speed generally have lower amounts of force output versus muscles that are contracting at slower speeds have the ability to generate more force. Um, so that's one thing we're gonna talk about. One uh, kind of another dimension of this is the length tension relationship. Um, so this is saying that muscle cells that are really stretched out when they try to contract can't generate a lot of force. Muscle cells that are really compressed and try to contract also can't. There's a, there's a kind of a happy medium spot, a Goldilocks zone where when you try to contract, you generate the most force. 
But if you multiply these two relationships together, you get a really nice looking plot, this length, tension, velocity relationship. And this is uh, generally true for most muscles or most joints. Um, you can also look, instead of doing length, tension, velocity, you could look at uh, angle. Uh, you could look at uh, tension being um, torque, and you could look at velocity being angular rate. So in the rotational dimension, it's the same thing. Uh, so this is an example of the elbow joint. So think about doing bicep curls when your arms are fully extended. You can't generate a lot of force. Same thing here. You can't generate a lot of force when your elbows are really flexed. You generate the most force when you're in this happy medium zone. So every joint's like that. You're not going to generate the most force when your core is separated as far as it can go. Your oblique muscles are fully stretched. There's going to be a happy medium spot for these things. Um, and also, when you look at the speed dimension, that's just a whole other thing to consider. So what I'm going to try to do is interpolate some batting data onto that curve. Um, so again, these are those two swings. Um, one swing in particular, so George Springer swing in green, you know, really high exit velocity. And if you look at the torque uh, elbow flexion uh, plot, you can see, so it actually it starts by um, from the right to the left. So in the stance is more on the right, and then the, the curve goes to the left. And I don't know if this thing is even working, I can't see it, but um, you'll see Austin Meadows, you know, he makes contact, again, when he's really flexed, before he gets to extend his elbow. Um, so he's not really utilizing that full back elbow acceleration. He makes a lot of acceleration, but he wastes it. Uh, whereas George Springer, he, he peaks in angular acceleration just before contact with his back elbow. So it might be one of the reasons why he's able to get a lot of uh, exit velocity. But anyways, this is a concept I think is going to be more of a, a future training tool. Instead of applying a general range of, hey, you want to have 45 degrees of hip separation, I think you could maximize a player within themselves and see when are you timing you know, these forceful movements during your swing? Are you in a stretched out position? Are you, you know, at the oppel length tension relationship of your muscle? Um, and I really think that's gonna be the way we get the most out of our players from every joint, leading from the ground up to, up to that back elbow. Uh, actually, I thought this was right when I made it. This is not right, but I was trying to, you know, my interpretation of where these three sport motions kind of sit on a plane. Maybe for the back elbow, it makes sense. You know, golfers, you know, they, they're more of a slow movement. They get to the peak backswing and they have to initiate from a still, a still point. Um, pitchers, on the other hand, are you know, making these contractions at really high speeds. So they're a little bit further down on that speed profile, but they generate the same amount of force because they're probably in a better position with their joints. And then batters are kind of maybe somewhere in the middle uh, on the speed side. All right, so one other thing I'll talk about, um, you know, I think making performance gains on a player is, is great with technology. I do think there's ability to project player performance. So for the teams out there, this is some things we did. Uh, it's called biomechanical equivalence. We've done it for three organizations. Um, we also have our own database now. But the concept is uh, as such. We'll test swing mechanics. Uh, with everything I kind of show, there's some other metrics. We'll test range of motion, so every joint. And then we'll try to make models for each different affiliate. We'll have a, a database that can project player performance from rookie to A ball, A ball to double A, and up the chain um, as such. So again, these are just some inputs from some of our reports. I, I, we've shared most of this, nothing, nothing interesting there. But um, yeah, so this is a model we did for uh, Carlos Correa. We, this is back when he was in high A. We projected his batting average to be, I think was it 266 there? Um, and then right now, you know, his batting average at the major league level is 277. Things what we would do is we'll take his current stats, his uh, you know, current biomechanics, um, and we'll feed them into the model and project his stats at the major league level. And it did a pretty good job for that. Um, these are some major predictors in that model. Uh, we use a Bayesian model where we just create, I think, over 100,000 iterations. We'll choose the top five performing models and just average those concepts together. You know, things that show up here, uh, this is interesting to me, the, the, you know, back wrist pronation was a high performer in the swing. And I can't remember who was talking about wrist dynamics yesterday. Uh, I think it was a coach from Michigan. Um, but that was really interesting to me. And I, yeah, maybe there's something there. But other things you'll see, a lot of these acceleration, angular acceleration measures pop up in the model as good predictors of uh, you know, batting average in this case. Um, but again, this is just a one team model. This isn't the pool, but it's pr some pretty interesting things. Uh, another one we did was for uh, strikeout rate. Um, and again, I can't really read the measures, but it, it performed pretty well. It uh, you know, estimated what we thought his strike rate would be, and then compared to what it is now, it's pretty close. Uh, these are some variables that went into the strikeout rate model. All right, 
Uh, so I, yeah, I went really fast there, but we're gonna do a little quiz now, so hopefully you guys um, are writing down some notes. Um, what we'll do, uh, I have these little shirts that say Kinetic Chain on them. I made it as a project for, uh, for some, some funds I was trying to raise for a society, but anyways, I have mediums, larges, XLs, and uh, yeah, if you answer the question right, we'll, uh, we'll hand you one of the shirts. So. so first one, what variable is represented by this formula? Yeah, that's it. Angular Lot, who said that? Yeah, what size shirt do you want? Uh, XL. XL, all right. All right, next one. Um, what motion has the greatest trunk separation and what motion has the least trunk separation? Pitcher batter, yep. So golfers were, were close, but we, we had a bigger range with the, the pitchers. They get anywhere from 60 to 90 in that, in that, that image. All right, next one. What is the formula for the kinetic energy equation we showed? Yeah. <laughs> uh, one half uh, rotational inertia times angular velocity squared. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, and last one. Um, what was Andrew McCutcheon's hip rotation velocity? Is that Rick? Yeah, 850, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, funny story, this is actually one of the worst product decisions we ever made. We made this app back in 2013 where we were importing blast data and you know, having people ask questions of the survey, like what is your angle at stance? And someone somewhere thought it'd be a good idea to say, let's ask them what their hip speed is. Like anyone's gonna know what their freaking hip speed is. But that was legitimately in one of our apps. It was a question, how would you rate your hip speed? That's what happens when you let investors make product decisions. But anyways, um, that's all the questions I have. Um, there's my contact information. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Jeff and the team, for having me. Um, we, we've got time for questions, if anybody has questions for Ben. Uh, yeah, have you folks looked at uh, the role of deceleration and whether there's a positive or negative relationship there at any point at contact for hitting? Yeah, I figured that was gonna come up. Um, I might have a slide that I can look at it in batters, but the, the peak decelerations we see are typically after ball contact. Um, and I don't know, now it went black, but oh, there it is. But yeah, typically they're, they're after ball contact, so uh, we haven't done too much with them. Yeah, the elite batters, you talked about them not separating their core. Can you just explain that just a little bit? Uh, yeah, um, so just from the data we observed, um, the, the amount of separation a batter will get uh, is anywhere from 20 to 35 degrees. That's about as much as they'll get. Uh, we saw in golfers and pitchers, they get anywhere from you know, 50 to 90 degrees of separation. It's just something we observed in our professional batting database. But there's not much separation of the pelvis. They're more locked together. So at foot plant, the pelvis and the trunk generally move together. Um, uh, have you compared those hitters numbers in game and practice, if there's any difference between them? Uh, I would love to, and I think that's probably where the future will come with more markerless technology is getting in-game data as opposed to having someone mark it up in their spandex. Uh, it's probably a lot lower than what they do, in, or it's gonna be different what they do in game, I'm sure, but uh, we tried to get it as most, uh, you know, to mimic game conditions as possible. They were throwing against, you know, live BP. Uh, you could do it against live, live pitchers as well, but the, uh, yeah, the logistics of doing that were, are sometimes difficult, so we usually keep it at live BP. But yeah, they may be different. Uh, if I heard you correctly, I thought you said that uh, kinetic chain and sequence don't um, have relevance in hitting. Is that, did I hear that right? And if I did, can you explain? Yes, uh, so I think it's a little different um, than what we're used to in golf, where, you know, or in, pitch, in pitching, where pitchers who you know, separate their core and have, you know, their hip speed fire uh, at time A, and then their trunk fires 75 milliseconds later. You know, the longer that gap is in time, the more ball velocity pitchers generate. In batting, there's no relationship like that. There's no, di we don't see batters that have better uh, bat speed having any difference in timing. They're typically, um, you know, batters that do have that sequencing where they fire their hips and their trunk. We've just seen across our database, there's no correlation to bat speed. So from that performance measure, it just doesn't help batters produce bat speed. Awesome, well thank you everybody.